as witnesses to crimes were terrified of testifying against any criminal identified as a purple gangster the purples appeared to have an absolute immunity from police interference for a long time the purple gang allegedly got sloppier and more conceited over time they were well known to the general public dressed garishly and frequented the city's nightclubs the Purples soon developed a romantic aura that set them apart from the other gangs in Detroit because they resided in posh homes. Resentments, egos, and disputes among the gang members would eventually lead to the downfall of the Purple Gang. In today's video, we're taking a look at the Purple Gang and their ultimate destruction in the 1930s. Welcome back, and don't forget to subscribe to the Past Crimes channel. In 1917, three years before national prohibition was established by a constitutional amendment, the Michigan legislature outlawed the sale of alcohol. Henry Ford, who owned the River Rouge plant, was a strong supporter of the Damon Act and the Wiley Act, which, beginning in 1918, effectively outlawed almost all possession, production, and sale of alcohol. Ford also wanted a sober workforce. Due to Detroit's proximity to Ohio, bootleggers also imported alcohol from Toledo as well as Canada, where it was still legal. However, the Damon Act was declared unconstitutional in 1919 by the state Supreme Court. In the United States, in 1920, the 18th Amendment was adopted and prohibition took full effect. The port city of Windsor became a major point for smuggling alcohol products into the U.S. The Bishop School, a public school in Detroit, was where the majority of the core members of the Purple Gang attended. Many of them were assigned to the Division for Problem Children. The majority of the gang's members were American-born children of Jewish immigrants who arrived in the country during the Great Immigration Wave that occurred between 1881 and 1914, mostly from Russia and Poland. Abe, Joe, Raymond, and Izzy Bernstein were four brothers from New York City who had relocated to Detroit and were in charge of the gang. Under the guidance of more experienced neighborhood gang members like Charles Leiter and Henry Shore, the Purple Gang quickly advanced from petty theft and extortion to armed robbery and truck hijacking. They became well known for their brutality and operations, and to provide the gang with muscle, they would bring in gang members from other cities. There are several theories as to how the name Purple Gang came to be. Some claim that it was given because one of the members was a boxer who wore purple shorts, while others claim that it was a nickname given by local shopkeepers. The group developed a reputation as hijackers who preyed on the alcohol cargoes of more seasoned and established criminal organizations. Al Capone, a gangster from Chicago, didn't want to expand his operations in Detroit, so to avoid a bloody conflict, he started a business arrangement with the Purple Gang. The gang successfully ran the lucrative business of supplying Canadian whiskey to the Al Capone gang in Chicago for several years. The Purple Gang also engaged in other illegal activities, such as the increasingly common practice of kidnapping rival gang members in exchange for ransom. The FBI had a suspicion that they were involved in the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby. The Purple Gang ruled the Detroit underworld by the late 1920s, having complete control over the city's vice, gambling, liquor, and drug trades. Additionally, they were in charge of the neighborhood wire service, which informed the local bookmakers about horse races. The gang members socialized with more notorious mob figures and expanded to other cities. In his later years, Abe Bernstein co-owned several casinos in Miami, Florida, with his friends Meyer Lansky and Joe Adonis. The gang took over prizefight movies and forced theaters to overcharge to show them and would also defraud insurance companies. The gang participated in the Cleaners and Dyers' War as its size and power increased. They also started hiring themselves out as hitmen. The Purples benefited from the unions and associations in the Detroit laundry industry. They were employed to intimidate independent non-union workers and to maintain order among union members. According to rumors, Abe Axler and Eddie Fletcher were asked to join the scheme. 
Nine Purple Gang members were detained in 1927 and later cleared of all charges after being accused of plotting to extort money from Detroit wholesale cleaners and dyers. In a trial that lasted from 1928 to 1929, Harry Rossman, the president and owner of famous cleaners and dyers in Detroit, Michigan, rose to prominence in the public eye as the main witness who testified against the notorious Purple Gang. During the occasionally violent conflict known as the Cleaners and Dyers Wars, the prosecution alleged extortion activities against businesses in the Detroit area. According to Rossman's testimony, the Purple Gang demanded $1,000 per week from Rossman's company and those of other cleaners and dyers in the neighborhood for protection against violence. The conflict over territory between the Italian, Irish, and Jewish bootleggers quickly turned into a Detroit mob war. The Licavalli squad, led by the brothers Tommy and Pete Licavalli, engaged in a vicious turf war with the Purples. March 1927 saw the deaths of three men. The victims were brought to Detroit as hired assassins for the Purple Gang, and the killings were thought to have been committed in retaliation for a double cross. Eddie Fletcher and Abe Axler, members of the Purple Gang, were the primary suspects in the killings because the assassins were found dead in an apartment they had rented. The suspects, along with the other Purples and associates, were interrogated, but no one was ever convicted of the crimes. These murders took place in apartment 308 of the Mila Flores Apartments. The Chicago St. Valentine's Day Massacre was thought to have involved the Purple Gang. A hijacked load of alcohol was reportedly traveling to Chicago on February 13, 1929, when Abe Bernstein reportedly called Bugs Moran to inform him of the situation. Moran, who was engaged in a turf war with Capone, had only recently started to put his trust in Bernstein, who had previously served as Capone's principal Canadian liquor supplier. Seven men were killed in what has come to be known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre when four men, two of whom were wearing police uniforms, went to SMC Cartage on North Clark Street the following day. They then opened fire with Thompson submachine guns. In 1931, an intra-gang dispute ended in the murder of three Purples by Chicago gangsters who had been imported to Detroit to help out the Purple Gang. By working outside the area designated for them by the Purple Gang leadership, the three men had broken a rule of the underworld. On September 16, 1931, Joseph Leibowitz, Herman Hemi Paul, and Isidore Sucker, a.k.a. Joe Sucker, were persuaded to enter an apartment on Collingwood Avenue. They thought they were going to the Purple Leaders' Peace Summit. The three men had a brief conversation before being shot dead. The gang was apprehended by the police after they barged into Fletcher's apartment and discovered the suspects playing cards. Three high-ranking Purples, Irving Milberg, Harry Keywell, and Raymond Bernstein were found guilty of first-degree murder in the Collingwood Manor Massacre and received life sentences. Another suspect, Harry Fleischer, evaded capture until 1932, but he was never found guilty in connection with the massacre. As witnesses to crimes were terrified of testifying against any criminal identified as a purple gangster, the purples appeared to have an absolute immunity from police interference for a long time. The purple gang allegedly got sloppier and more brazen over time. They were well known to the general public, dressed garishly, and frequented the city's nightclubs. The Purples soon developed a romantic aura that set them apart from the other gangs in Detroit because they resided in posh homes. The Purple Gang would eventually disintegrate due to resentments, egos, and disputes among themselves. The police eventually took action against the gangs as members started to leave too much physical proof of their crimes. Joe Bernstein and Abe Bernstein both received lengthy prison sentences after previously avoiding significant jail time through coercion and corrupt officials, and Philip Keywell had already been found guilty of murder. Abe Axler and Eddie Fletcher, two aggressive and senior members, were shot dead as different waves of bloodier infighting followed. 
Following more internal strife, Henry Shore, a former partial boss, was also eliminated. A few gang members fled Detroit, while others were killed by other gang members or rival gangsters. Several other members were later in prison. Eventually, a rival Sicilian gang decided to take out the Purples because they were getting tired of fighting with them. Detroit's modern-day mafia stepped in and filled the void as the Purple Gang ultimately self-destructed, 